This lecture is to accompany CIS 307, Chapter 4, the first half of the chapter, the Relational Model 3, Advanced Topics. The chapter begins on page 119 and discusses views. A view is, it depends what kind of a database you're using. When you're using an access database, a view is nothing more than a query. But reality is when you get into your higher end databases, Oracle and databases managed by SQL Management Studio, we're using MySQL, um, a view is a separate entity. A view is a picture of the data, of what the data looks like. Um, it's similar to a query, but it is its own unique entity. A view can be used to create to as the data source for reports, for charts, for all types of objects. It's less involved than the full database. People don't have to get as engrossed in the understanding of all of the tables because I've created a view for that particular user to look at the data fields that that particular user needs to look at in a way that makes sense to that user. I'm going to create a view uh, possibly a different view for different each individual different user in my database. Another big advantage of views is it allows me to have security. I'm often going to have data in a table that I don't want a particular user to have access to. So rather than giving that user access to the table, I would create a view for that user. So showing only the specific columns that that user has access to. So I would grant um, the that user access to see that view but not to see the actual underlying table. So one of the, some of the big advantages of views are discussed on page 120. The user actually thinks they're working with a table itself. I know in databases I work in I often have to you know double check and triple check to see if I'm looking at the table or I'm looking at a view. Um, the, just as an example, the database here at the college that, that I work in most often, that's your registration database, has nearly a thousand tables in it. And there is no way I am going to learn how each of those thousand tables is related to each other. Yes, there are tables that I use very regularly and I do understand how those relationships are, but I also use a variety of views that our database administrator has actually set up because um, she's received the same requests for similar data over and over and over so she's created views that might pull together fields from five or six different tables into one view and then I can use that view to create the queries to access the, the the more specific data that I need so I'm using that view rather than using that than, than going back to those five tables. As an end user in that case, it, like I said, I have to double check to figure out whether I'm looking at a view or looking at a table. Most of the time, it doesn't really matter. Then another big advantage is, is the view actually re-executes each time that somebody looks at the view, the command that created the view is re-executed. So, so the command that created the view is often a long select statement. You know, in, in the previous chapter, we dealt with some select statements that were three, four, maybe five lines long. Understand that I work in with, with uh, select statements that if I were to put them into notepad and print them out would be three pages long. That's how many subqueries are in there as it looks at really both tables and views, but, but mostly when I get into those long table uh, queries, I'm looking just at tables and that, that select statement itself could be three typed pages single space. So, um, if I create a view, I have that long complicated select statement. Every time I look at the view, the query that or, or the select statement that forms the view is actually re-executed. That means that every time I look at the view, I can see the latest and greatest that has been added that meets the criteria of that view, the latest columns. Oh, well, columns are added into a view, but the latest data additions and data updates to that view. 
the query underneath the view is known as the defining query. So data entered into the underlying tables and data modified in the underlying tables is immediately available in the view. Okay, we're going to go ahead and switch over to my SQL here and zoom this up a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and create some views. So this first one, what we're doing, and this is in your text on page 120, second page of the chapter, using the Premier Database, um, creating a view called Housewares from the part table where the class equals HW is what we're going to do. So create view is the actual command here. Then we have the name of the view, and then we use the as, and then this is the actual select statement. So I want to make sure that you do understand the difference between the query and the view. So we're going to start off and first just look at the actual select statement itself. So the way that I'm going to do that is I I've, I've have the whole thing typed out, but I'm only going to select or, or execute these three rows. So I went ahead and highlighted the rows that are the select statement itself. And I'm going to execute that. And what that does is it, that's what we did last chapter. So it, I selected part number description on hand and price from part where the class is equal to HW. I get these three rows on um, these four columns. I see it right here. Um, that's the end of it. It did it. So now I'm going to create a view. So I'm going to go ahead and select these, these four rows and I'm going to execute that command. And you see, I don't get any resulting data set. I can see down here in my output that it did create the view. What I can do then over here in my Premier Database is underneath tables here, I should see something called views. I'm going to go ahead and refresh. And I should then see the housewares view. So when I look at that view, um, I can see the columns that are in that view stored down here below. Or I can expand by clicking on the triangle. And from there, I can see the columns specifically. If I actually want to see the data that is now in that view, I notice my select statement is to select everything from housewares, what I just named the view. So by selecting that, I'm, again, I'm, I'm seeing the same resulting data set. But to understand that this data is not stored in something called housewares, this data is still stored in part. As my users are out there inputting into forms, and that's modified modifying or adding data to the part table that will automatically happen to a view. So um, I could even query my view by by limiting it with criteria with a, a specific set of criteria. So in this next one what I'm doing is I'm selecting everything from housewares where the on hand is less than 25. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that and you'll see I, I now get two records rather than four records because only these two have an on hand value of less than 25. So my criteria that I've put into my where statement is actually from the view, not from the table as it would have been last week. When I am done with a view or I want to change a view, you'll probably find that it's best to just modify the view and then recreate it. So if you really wanted to, unless there are huge, huge views, um, you probably, what the author is recommending is that you just drop the view and then mod, if you needed to, modify the view. So the command to actually drop the view is just drop view and then the name of the view. And again, you don't feel like anything happened over here. Uh, you don't see anything that happened. Over here on the left, you do have to hit refresh in the workbench version that we're using. And you'll notice then if I go to views, there, there are no views in my Premier database. The next example that um, the author uses is on page 122, oh, excuse me, 123. And this is creating a view um, called housewares, but and that's why I had to drop it because I'm going to create a, another view with the same name. This time, I'm giving the field names a more meaningful description for that particular person. L let me give you an example of this. I did some. I've done a lot of database consulting at um, factories, and when you're in a factory setting, the people out on the floor would refer to themselves the, the, refer to something called their clock number because it's the 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 number of their time card that they punch into the clock time clock. 
then you would talk to the people like the accountants and the people in the offices and they might refer to something called employee number then you actually get digging into the data and you find out that the clock number and the employee number are really the exact same thing it's just because of the nature of the two separate parts of the company that employees from the separate pieces of the company the nature of their job is so different that they actually end up referring to it in two different manners so if I was going to create a view that somebody from the maybe the foreman from the on the factory floor was going to look at to view some employee data I might reference that column clock number and to the um, accountant who's looking at some of the data out of the employee table I might reference that column as employee number because that's what how he or she thinks of it but behind the scenes in my actual table it might be called emp ID I might have abbreviated it down I might have used ID rather than num uh, that's what I tend to do so so point is is what the field is named in the table may be completely different from what the an end user use it, refers to it as and different end users in different parts of the company may refer to the same thing by different words so by using that view I can can customize it to each individual user in this this example the author is shortening the field names so p num p and then DESC, this is for part number, part description, on hand, he's abbreviated down, price. So when I create the view, notice the difference between the two functions, two commands. Up here I just created the view as, and then I have my select statement. I did not specify what I wanted the fields to be named, therefore they were named part number, description, on hand, and price. In this one, in parentheses, I've put what I want the columns to be named in this particular view. The rest of the command is exactly the same. This is the one that is limiting it to just those where the class equals HW. So when I select and execute these commands, now the view that I've created, and I'm going to have to refresh over here on the left, if I want to see it over here, see how it has abbreviated field names over here on the left, or more specifically, um, over here I might do something like select, whoops, excuse me, select star from housewares, and if I execute that, I can see how the column headings are the abbreviated um, names that I specified in the actual create creation view statement. On the next example, which in your text would be on page 124, is creating a view using fields from more than one table. And this is a much more common um, time that you're going to create a view is because you're pulling data from multiple tables. Your end users sometimes can handle you'll have a level of end user who can handle actually creating a select statement or taking views and pulling them into a more user-friendly database like access but that end user cannot handle relationships so you might have a view that you have already linked into some type of even a report writing program like, like crystal reports so the view is tied into the crystal reports template and they know how to do some minor data manipulation within that um, report filter but they would not have even a clue how to create relationships between multiple tables so that's a very common time that you'll use a view so here we're creating the view we're naming the view sales cust we're naming the giving specific names to the five columns in the view again abbreviating them down S for sales C for customer um, here's your select statement if I were to select just these three lines and execute it would show it to me in a resulting data set here um, so I'm not even getting field name changes here it's rep num last name first name etc by creating the view adding that line I see nothing here um, I could do a select star from sales cust to see what's in the view notice it's the same records the column names have different have the headings that I specified in my create statement if I refresh over here on the left I should see the sales cust uh, I need to stop double clicking I should be clicking on the plus triangles 
uh, to expand it. But if I uh, click on the triangle to expand, again, I can see those field names in the view are the field names that I specified. So even though it is showing me the repnum in this field, I specified I wanted it to be named snum, slast, etc. So for purposes of this view, that is what it's named. Again, just as before, once I have created the view, I could actually query a subset of data off of that view. So here I'm selecting just three of the five columns, SNUM, SLAST, SFIRST, from that view, and only where the CNUM or customer number equals 282. So I should get only um, SNUM 35 for Richard Hull. So um, as I said, often the field names in the tables are abbreviated. Um, they don't have spaces. They're difficult for users to understand. So I may make a more meaningful field name in the actual view. Um, and we went over all of those commands. So in summary, which is on page 126, the advantages of views are it gives us data independence allows us to add fields to the table. Adding fields to the table does not influence the end users and how, what they see. It doesn't confuse them because I added five more columns to the table that they never saw before and they freak out. Um, confusing field names to the users is irrelevant because again they do not see the field names specified in the columns um, if I've specified different field names for their purposes. Views are customizable so a different view of the same data in a, maybe a different sort order, or excuse me, a different column order, or a different field names could be created for each specific user. Also through a view, I can limit a user's access to fields. So if I had maybe um, some data in an employee table that I wanted uh, a number of people to be able to get access, maybe to employee phone numbers or addresses, but in that same table, I also had social security numbers or something that I wanted to be more secure that I did not want everybody to have access to, I could um, create a view only showing those fields or columns that my end user is allowed to see but still allowing the other data to be stored in the underlying table. The next topic that the author goes into are indexes. These begin on page 126. To understand indexes you have to think conceptually just like an index in the back of a book. You know if I wanted to know all the different pages in my textbook that have to do with creating a table. I'm going to go to the index at the back of the book and I, maybe I'd look up create and if I did that I would find create table references on page 72, 73, 74, 105, 131, uh, 350, etc. So it's showing me all the different places that, that that create table command is at or whatever I've happened to look up, look up in the index. Uh, an index within a database is very much conceptually like, conceptually like that. It's one point that can reference all the places that a particular item is used um, within a, a specific table. Indexes typically are only applied to databases with large number of records. Uh, da uh, an index can speed up certain things, but an index also can slow down other things. Uh, the advantage of an advantages of index really come into play only on databases with hundreds of thousands of records or at least tens of thousands of records. So applying indexes to our small examples with maybe 20 records I think in our largest table is would really be something we would not do. We're going to so we learn how to create indexes. Uh, to understand it better take a look in your book on page 127 at figure 4-10. When you take a look at that, there's the customer table that we've been used to seeing in the first three chapters, but we've added one more field, a record number field. That record number field was just a sequential num numeric, um, uh, I mean, it's specifically a record number t to that, um, referring to that sp specific row. So if we went from there, and created an index off of the customer number, it would look just like the picture on page, uh, same page, the second picture, figure 4-11. Now this is a, customer number is the primary key, so I'm only going to have one customer number, 
or one record for each customer number in the customer table. As a result, I'm only going to have one record number for each customer number. So customer uh, number in the left-hand column is in, sorted in numerical order, and it's letting me know that customer 148 is record 1, customer 282 is record 2, etc. It's actually so simple, it's a situation where I probably would not refer to use an index. However, the better example is on page 128 in figure 4-12. In this situation, and there's two of them that they've shown there, they're giving me like the credit limit index. So if I were to create an index off of the field credit limit, that is not the primary key nor foreign key. So it's letting me know that people with a or records, excuse me, records with a credit limit of 5,000 are found in record number 4 and record number 8. A credit limit of 7,500 is found in record 1, 3, 9, and 10. See, it's very much like the index in the back of a book. Um, the right-hand two columns on the right in that same figure 4-12 are for the re, uh, sales rep, rep number. And so we've created an index on rep number, so it's letting me know that, for example, rep number 65, the last one, is going to be in records 3, 5, and 7. To understand indexes, um, generally you're going to create an index anytime that the field is the primary key of the table. Most databases are going to do that one naturally for you automatically. You're not going to have to do anything as a result of it, but it does really depend where the what how the data is stored. Um, you may very well do an index on the field that is a foreign key in a relationship that you've created. That's going to speed up some things um, as it searches and creates that relationship from one table to the other. Relating that data can some, is of course going to take time. So if I have a view or a query and by creating an index on the foreign key it's going to be able to find that match faster and speed up the resulting data set. I'm going to create an index on a field that is frequently used in a sort order. You'll often see people create an index, for example, on last name because that is something that is commonly sorted by. I'm not going to create an index on first name because not very often do we actually sort by first name. I'm going to create an index on a field that is commonly used in criteria. So in our examples that we've done so far in the text, the author seems to constantly be using the credit limit field as a, one of the criteria. So if that's the situation in your company and people are often looking at that field, I would create an index for that field. One thing to remember is that in tech indexes can be added on the fly. You can add them at any time. You might have a database in place for two or three years and somebody says, you know, when I try to sort by such and such, it takes a, you know, by the last name, it takes a long time. But when I sort by the em employee ID, it doesn't take very long. And I might realize that, well, that's because employee ID is the primary key. I set up an index on that one. I didn't set up an index on last name. I go add that index and suddenly sorting those, you know, 10,000 records on last name doesn't take as long. So we're going to go ahead and switch over to the MySQL to get a feel for how this is actually done in SQL. It's pretty simple. To create an index, you simply use the command create index. You follow that with the table name, uh, excuse me, an in, a name for the index. In this case, I named the index customer name. And then I'm going to tell it the table that I want that index and the field that I want that index. This is the example you have on the bottom of page 128. So I'm creating an index named customer name on the field called custom on the field called customer name from the table customer. I'm going to go ahead and execute that and I'm going to feel like nothing happened. I should see in my output down at the bottom that it did create an index. Zero rows were affected. If I refresh over here on the left and I went and took a look at the table uh, customer, I should now see that an index has been created um, on customer name. 
I can tell that simply because customer name is bolded. The primary key, see the PK in my SQL is single underlined and has the PK. Customer name I created an index on, so it also is appears in bold. It's not underlined because it is not part of the primary key. Um, if I, I'm going to go ahead and collapse that. I'm going to take a look at the uh, customer table again and, and notice that no other fields I guess it's, that's where the next one is there's no other fields that are in bold the next index that the author wants you to create this one is on the bottom of page 129 this is creating an index that I'm going to name rep bal rep, rep representative balance and again from the customer table but I'm creating it on the combination of two fields the representative number sales representative's number and the balance field but I want the balance in descending order so notice I put the DESC so I'm going to go ahead and select those query lines and execute again I'll feel like nothing happened I do see the check down here uh, I don't notice anything different over here until I refresh once I refresh I should see the rep num appears in bold. It does not show me the balance in bold. It only shows me the rep num because that's the first part of the index. Um, indexes can have some disadvantages as well. Um, while they do make data retrieval more efficient on fields that are commonly sorted or used in criteria, Indexes can also slow down the overall database because every time that I add or edit a record to the database, the index itself has to be updated. So there will actually be a slight delay in the save process. We should be talking about, you know, a second here, if that, on every save, probably a microsecond. But still, it does slow down the overall database performance. Indexes require additional storage space. I mean, if you think about it, not only do I have to store all the data, but I also have to store that index that tells me which record number is associated or record numbers are associated with the field or fields that I've specified in my index. As a result of this, I may find that I create an index on something that I later decide isn't useful. So that's where the drop index command would come into play. The author does use the drop index command on page 130 and it's basically just going to remove the index. Notice I've selected the, uh, changed it to drop instead of create index uh, then whatever I named the index remember up here when I created the index I named it customer name or here I named it rep bal so drop the index and then the, on whatever the table is that uh, I created the index on so I'm going to execute that I'm going to go ahead and execute the other one again I'll see in my output down here the the green check mark that it did do it no rows were affected if I want to see it over here to the left in my uh, workbench product I'm gonna have to refresh and I should now notice that the bold is gone from from those fields that bold indicated that those fields were indexed the bold does remain on my primary key as well as the underline and the PK to let me know that this is the primary key of that table primary key by default is automatically indexed. So in a nutshell you have to ask yourself do the benefits of any particular index outweigh the disadvantages of the perhaps slower sp um, speed of my database and the additional storage space. Again when you get into databases that are in tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of records you'll find that the index benefits definitely do outweigh the disadvantages but that's a decision you'll have to take on a case-by-case -case basis. The author spends a small amount of time on pages 130 and 131 discussing security. A uh, database administrator has access to all data. The database administrator should be able to see all columns, all fields, all everything. But very few end users actually have access to all of the data. Security is granted or can be granted through MySQL to both tables and to views. But the 
author is spending hardly any time on this at the, at least at this point um, you know just a few paragraphs and giving you just a couple of basic commands there are many other security commands that are not covered in your text I went ahead and um, showing you the commands to grant and revoke security here in SQL but we do not actually have a users table so for example in this first command when I simply grant select that means I'm granting the ability to select use the select uh, uh, statement or command on the view housewares which I created earlier to Jones well if I grab that and I execute it I'm gonna get a message down here that says it can't find any matching row in the user table okay we haven't taken time to set up a user table to actually says who the users of our database are so the author introducing security at this point without giving us the tools we need to actually test and play with it well there's there's not a lot that there's not anything you can do that you don't have the full tools um, other than understand that it's the grant command in order to grant that ability to select and then it'd be on this specific table view etc that you want and who you're granting that access to and then to get rid of it it would just simply be the revoke command notice the only difference between these two lines is the words grant or the words revoke and then the the last thing that we're going to cover in this half of the lecture is the integrity and there's quite a bit of discussion in here on integrity um, there's three different types of integrity that the author covers entity integrity uh, a primary key for example cannot accept a null value you may want to add that to another field that is not the primary key uh, basically stating that that field cannot accept a null value means that the record cannot be added to the database if that particular field is not filled in or completed um, the second type of integrity that the author discusses is referential integrity referential integrity simply means that a record cannot be added to the related table um, or the foreign table whichever you want to refer to it as unless it somehow relates back to the primary table and the third one that the author um, discusses is legal values integrity that is actually applied to a field not to a table and it's basically just saying that data added to that field must meet some type of integrity rule that I've put in place so we're gonna go ahead and take a look at each of these the um, author instructions for the MySQL I found to be rather confusing um, went ahead and went into we're, we're gonna go ahead and show you um, exactly how um, this was how, how I went about getting this these things um, in place um, in some cases there'd be some differences that you could do I'm also in this um, starting to introduce you to the alter table command which is actually what will be the first thing we'll be talking about in the second half of the chapter four lecture but I, I went ahead and am introducing it to you here so it may make more sense once we you um, finish the complete chapter four okay so the first one we looked at remember is entity integrity so we're just going to use the primary key and we're basically stating that the primary key I'm adding this not null so here's my basic create table commands th uh, that we learned in the last chapter I'm creating a table now called table suppliers this example is not in your textbook I've split it out I find it easier to read this way I believe your author strung all this stuff together but when you start really getting into specifics for any particular field in this case vendor name not null and is the primary key I'm specifying all of that so what you would have had last week what you would have had last week probably would have looked more like this create table the name of the table and then in parentheses all of the different fields with the data type and these are all character fields so how many characters it's allowing into each of those fields separated by commas an opening parenthesis here before the first data type and a closing parenthesis here after the last 
excuse me, before the first field name and after the last data type. If you notice, that's really exactly what I've done here. I personally just find this much easier to read. So create table, table suppliers. I did my opening parenthesis up here. And then each field on a separate line, again, this is simply some, um, this type of indenting is simply nothing more than allowing the the programmer, in this case you, to follow your own logic. Stringing it together or separating it is irrelevant. Um, but now that I've added so much more to this particular field, the author does not really talk about the not null um, that I could see in the in the chapter, um, but d does talk about the at making something a primary key. Many people would say this is kind of of uh, redundant because by saying it's a primary key, you don't need to say that it's not null. But but by having both of them, you're it is rare yet possible to have a primary key be null as long as it's in in some database situations very rare but you know I figure better tell it twice that you can't have anything in it than not at all so um, here you're specifying that you do want this field to be the primary key notice after I've specified the type of data and can, since it's a character field the length in parentheses I could just have had primary key there it would work fine but uh, I've just always thrown not null in there. Um, some of you who have worked with access, you'll know that the moment you say something is a primary key, it immediately changes the property down in the bottom half to uh, that it will not accept null values. So generally, primary keys cannot, but it doesn't hurt to tell it twice. OK. Before I actually create this table, I want to refresh over here. I want to go ahead and take a look at my tables. And notice I have no table over here called supplier. So I refreshed, and I have no table in my Premier database called suppliers. I'm going to go ahead and select, and I'm going to go ahead and execute. And then you can see it did on my output tell me that it did create it. If I refresh, um, there's my table. It appears at the bottom of my list. And if I single click it, down here is the information in that table. Notice that vendor num is bold and underlined has a PK here. So the big difference between what we did last week and what we did this week, I chose to separate it out to show it to you in a way that I feel is much clearer. Additionally, we added primary key with just a space and then those words between the, the field name definitions and um, that's the constraint that we put on it so be, be, before the comma that's what the author did I also added not null um, so that it, when the table is created it creates a primary key in that table this again is adding entity integrity a primary key cannot accept null values be careful. Sometimes once you've learned that not null constraint, you might think, I'm going to put that on another field. So Because I have a lot of people who maybe haven't been entering in the customer's phone numbers the way they should be. So I'm going to go ahead and put not null on telephone number. Well, does that mean that if somebody truly doesn't have a telephone number, you aren't going to sell them your product? Remember, putting not null means that the end user has to fill something into that field or they can't get it added to the database. I would rather have no phone numbers than have my end user make up a telephone number in order to get a record into the actual database. The next type of integrity that the author discusses is referential integrity. This is very important. So let me try to explain it. In this uh, premier database that we used, we had two tables here, orders and order lines. The orders table told me things. Let me go ahead and refresh your memory here. Let me do a select star from orders. And the orders table had very little data in it. It told me the order number. That's the primary key of that table. The date of that order and the customer who placed the order. Now, right now, 
I could come into this table and add a record for a new order with a valid order number, a valid order date, and then I could say that customer 273 ordered it and I wouldn't even have to have a customer 273 in the customers table. So that's because there's no integrity between the two tables. So by enforcing referential integrity, creating and enforcing referential integrity, I'm basically saying that I cannot add a record to the related table, the child table, or in this case, the order line table, or the orders table, excuse me, if I have not first ensured that that related field, customer number, is added to the customers table. I can't say customer 273 ordered it if I don't first have a customer 273. Um, the order line table, okay, let me refresh your memory, is going to have the order number multiple times. I might call, a customer might, might call my company and on one order, say order number 21610, I might say that I want one DR93 and I want one DW11. So I'm ordering two different parts at the same time. Here's another one on order number 21617. I've ordered part number BV06, two of them, and part number CD52, four of them. So the order line uh, table is telling me specifically what specific items were ordered on the orders table. It's because I have a many-to-many -many relationship between orders and parts. One order could be for many parts, one part could appear on many orders, so I have to create that intermediate table, that order line table, so that one order could appear on many order lines. One order number could appear on many order lines. One part number could appear on many order lines. Notice over here on the left, I've now selected the order line table. Notice that the primary key of the order line table is both order number and part number. So the command to get that uh, referential integrity in there is I basically need to create that relationship and add that foreign key. And this is where I'm kind of jumping ahead because I didn't want to delete, recreate the whole table. So I thought it was easier to understand this by just using the alter table command, which is um, in this chapter the author begins to discuss alter table on page 137. That will be the next lecture. But using that, it's similar to a create table command, but I'm altering the table order line in order to add a foreign key to the field order number references over to the orders table on the field order number. I'm going to go ahead and select these three lines and execute. Once I've executed, um, down here in my output I'll just see that the uh, the green check that this has gone through. But over here, if I click on that order line table, I should see that there's related tables. There's now a target table to orders on the order number to order number and on update it's restricted and on delete it's restricted. Uh, let, let me give you an example of on delete. If I don't create that foreign key relationship, then I might from all validity, let me go back to my select so I can get some real data here, I might have this order and it's made on on uh, this order 21608 for this part. I could run without, if I didn't enforce that um, on delete, I could go into the orders table and I could delete order 21608. I would no longer know what customer it was. I would no longer know what date it was. That's all the data that's in the orders table. But I'd still have this, this loose record down here in order line. So by restricting that on up on both update and delete, that's saying that you know I, I have to have that order before I can enter the order lines. It has to exist in the orders table, but simultaneously I can't delete it out of the orders table unless I first get it deleted out of the specific order line items table. So 
you'll see down here the on update and the on delete and your author is, spends a little bit of time on that um, cascade update cascade delete um, more unfortunately in reference to their access part of their chapter than they do in reference to their MySQL part of the chapter. So in a nutshell that was understanding the referential integrity. The third type of integrity discussed is the legal values integrity and what this is not to um, a record a legal values is to a field. Um, it applies to a field and it restricts the type of data that can actually um, be entered into that field. You'll notice the difference is with uh, referential integrity uh, or even an entity integrity. I can leave the field but I can't leave the record. I can't save the record or leave the record until those types of integrity have been met. But with a legal values integrity I can leave the I cannot even leave the field unless it meets the um, integrity rule that I've put in place for that data. Uh, the first example that I'm going to do is one that I added to this suppliers table that I added, so this is not in your text. Um, I'm adding a integrity rule uh, that's a, a legal values integrity constraint where I'm saying that the vendor number has to be greater than 100. So I'm not allowing any vendor numbers to be entered in that are below 100. So I'm using that alter table command. This is the table I'm altering and I'm adding the check vendor num greater than 100. So I'm going to go ahead and execute and I should see down here that uh, just that green check that it has allowed me to actually execute that command. That's really all of the uh, input that I'm going to see that it did go through effectively or using the one that the author does. Um, again, just to make sure you understand what he's doing there on page 136 is he's showing you this part of it, um, just this the check part. But if you really want to execute the command, again, since the table already exists, it would be alter table. You could have done it back when you created the table but we didn't so we're now altering the table the table we're altering is customer we're adding a check to the credit limit that it must be in this range and we're going to go ahead and execute um, I did have to uh, make a little change there uh, so I paused for a moment I had a habit put TBL in front of the name of the table the author did not name it TBL he just named it customer and uh, I did was missing a closing parenthesis it's late so now that I grab these two and execute you should see again that the just the green check mark so that you know that uh, it did um, go through so that concludes the first half of the chapter 4 lecture